بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد بن عبد الله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وعلى كل من اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته واقتفى أثره إلى يوم الدين الله سبحانه وتعالى says in the beginning of سورة العنكبوت أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون ولقد فتن الذين من قبلهم فلا يعلمن الله الذين صدقوا ولا يعلمن الكاذبين. الله begins with his beautiful ayat ألف لام ميم أحسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون. Do the people think have they really thought that they will be left, just left alone, when they said that we have believed and they will not be tested? Do they think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take their word on the fact that they say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he will not test the reality of their iman? Certainly, talk is cheap. But everybody agrees that when your talk is translated into action after you've been tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is much more powerful and a much more certain way of declaring your iman. And Allah says that we will not be the first people to be tested because verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested those before us. And just as He tests us in our iman, Ibn Kathir rahimahullah says that the second ayah is a direct promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will certainly test us and send upon us fitan. Fitan, that's the word used in the Qur'an. أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Fitna. That is a test from Allah. And then Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ He's saying, O oh Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, O oh Muslims, all those who are listening, we have certainly tested those from before them. So, me and you and everybody here is not the first group of people to be tested by Allah. It is so that Allah will know those who are truthful and He will know those who lied. This is similar to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in which He says, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثم الصالحون ثم الأمثل فالأمثل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم indicates to us that fitan and trials and tests from Allah سبحانه وتعالى they are in accordance with the level of iman of the one being tested for example one who has a little tiny bit of iman somebody maybe he's a new Muslim maybe he's uh, far away from the deen Allah knows best he isn't as strong of a believer as others are he is not going to be tested in the same way that the messengers of Allah and the Sahaba were tested because their iman was at a level that we cannot begin to imagine. So Rasulullah says, أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بَلَاءَنِ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الصَّالِحُونَ ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلُ فَالْأَمْثَلِ Those who are strongest and severest in their tests for them are the prophets followed by the salihun, those who are devoutly righteous. ثُمَّ الْأَمْثَلُ فَالْأَمْثَلِ then the next in righteousness and then the next. So now we know in Islam, this is known by necessity. Every Muslim knows that if we pass the fitan of Allah, if we pass the tests of Allah, we will be in a good position on the Day of Judgment, inshaAllah. We will be rewarded for this by Allah. And if we fail our fitan, we fail the tests that Allah gives us, then certainly we will be in a worse off situation on the Day of Judgment unless we repent for this. So what exactly is a fitna? Because this may be a new word, a new vocabulary word to some brothers and sisters. Here are some quick definitions. 
Linguistically, it means a trial or a tribulation. It's a test. It's a test to see what you're going to do. And this very broadly means any type of test whatsoever. Then there's personal temptations. And these aren't, this isn't every type of fitna, but we're just naming a few. There's personal temptations. Example, brother says, Yo, achi, don't go to the mall. There's mad fitna there. You know what he's talking about when he says there's mad fitna at the mall. You know what he means. You know you have to lower your gaze, Habibi, when you go to the mall, if you have to go. So that's one type of fitna, a personal temptation, personal desire. And then there's a third type that we can mention right now. And that means civil discord or even civil war amongst the Muslims. And inshallah, this is going to be the focus of this series, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. But why? Why are we going to study civil discords and civil strifes and divisions that took place in Islamic history? Why are we going to look at what happened during the righteous khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and even beyond that inshallah? What are the benefits of it? Certainly, we have much work to do if we can study aqidah, if we study tafsir, if we study the meanings of all the words in the Qur'an. Most of us don't even have perfect tajweed, so we can increase our abilities in that field. Most of us can gain much knowledge if we studied hadith. So why have we chosen to dedicate this specific amount of time, bi'ithnillah, to studying history? There's so many reasons to study history, and it's not a quick, short answer. The first why do we study fitan? It's because we learn about Islam through what happens in its history. Although uneasy at times, this particular time in history that we're planning to study, inshallah, the time of the four khulafa and after them, bi'ithnillah, it was full of righteousness. Even though there were problems during this time, there was such great iman in the men that defined the era. For example, if you look at the time that we live in now, you might look at the great pop stars, they're not great, but look at the famous pop stars or the rappers or the actors, those who define the so-called pop culture. And you will say, because of these people, these individuals, they are famous. Therefore, they have followers and they have supporters and fans. And those fans have similar characteristics to these famous people. Yes or no? Yes, right? If you say, if this person's famous, there's a reason for it. That means he's being followed and the people who follow him have, they look up to the reason that makes him famous, his attributes. Whether he's a liar, whether he's promiscuous, whether he listens to music, makes music, whether he does drugs. These are things that make some of the famous people in our culture today, it makes them famous. So the famous people during the time of the Khilafah, the early Khilafah, they were not actors and pop stars and singers and no. They were the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Instead of the youth having pop stars to look up to, they had the greatest human beings in this ummah. Instead of looking up to this basketball player or this actor, they looked up to Abu Bakr. They looked up to Umar ibn Khattab. They looked up to the great companions of Rasulullah And of course, of course, without doubt, while Rasulullah was alive, he was the greatest example, and he still is the greatest example. But in regards to those who are still living, they define the era. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was the greatest living human being during the Khilafah until he died, Rahmahullah wa radiallahu anhu. And people would look up to him and his great example. So because he was such a righteous person and people followed him, his righteousness rubbed off on the whole society. Not only because he was a member of it, but because he was the ruler, he was the leader, and he had great influence on how society ran. And we'll see this very, very clearly, inshallah, in this series. When we talk about the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, you will see that no human being can compare to Abu Bakr who came after him. Nobody. The next reason we're going to study these fitan, and we're going to study the early history of Islam, is because Allah teaches us in the Quran that if we turn away from the stories and the lessons of those who came before us, then there is a punishment in such negligence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Taha, كَذَلِكَ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ مَا قَدْ سَبَقْ وَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ مِنْ لَدُنَّا ذِكْرًا 
من أعرض عنه فإنه يحمل يوم القيامة وزرا خالدين فيه وساء لهم يوم القيامة حملا Allah says in Surah Taha Thus we relate to you some information of what happened before And indeed we have given you from us a reminder Whoever turns away from it Verily they will bear a heavy burden on the day of resurrection They will be abiding in that and evil will be the load for them on the Day of Judgment. So clearly, if we turn away from the examples Allah guided us with, it's only going to hurt us. Allah says about the tribe of Thamud, وَأَمَّا ثَمُودُ فَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ فَاسْتَحَبُّ الْعَمَى عَلَى الْهُدَىٰ فَأَخَذَتْهُمْ صَاعِقَةُ الْعَذَابِ الْهُونِ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ as for Thamud, we guided them, but they preferred blindness to guidance. So they were overtaken with the sa'iq, with the screeching, unbearable sound that killed the whole city and the tribe of Thamud. And this is what happened because of what they used to do, what they earned for themselves. So certainly we have to take it upon ourselves to learn from the examples of those who came before us. Good and bad. We learn the good to repeat it, and we learn the bad so that we know what not to do, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And history is mentioned throughout the Qur'an. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the stories of righteous prophets, and others as well, who we can learn great lessons from. Even those who are not prophets, such as Maryam, Asiya, Talut, Luqman, etc. So many great lessons from these people. They're not even prophets. Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, she wasn't a prophet. She was not even the mother of a prophet. But... She was one of the four women who Rasulullah said that four women have reached the peak of Iman, have reached the peak of righteousness. Although many men have reached it, only four women have reached it. They are Maryam, the mother of Isa a.s. She wasn't a prophet either, according to the majority opinion. As well as Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. She took care of a prophet, Musa a.s. And then the other two are Fatima bint Muhammad wasallam, and Khadija, the wife of Rasulullah so two of them are surrounding the greatest prophet of all, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the other two surround other great, great messengers of Allah, Isa and Musa. So although they weren't prophets, there's great benefits in them. And certainly, we know that the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah alayhim, they are the greatest generation of anybody who is not a prophet. What does that say? Relating to Asiya and Talut and Luqman, it means that they are no less than these examples mentioned in the Qur'an. Therefore, we know that the Sahaba, Ridwan Allah alayhim, they are the greatest generation of human beings who are not prophets. They are the greatest cumulative generation of, in, of righteous people at one single point in time. And although the prophets individually are better than any single one of the Sahaba, we know that the Sahaba are the greatest generation of people who lived at one specific time, and that is the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if there were great role models for us in the Qur'an, certainly the Sahaba who are going to study in this series insha'Allah, they also pose for us excellent examples that we can learn from. So certainly we know that Luqman al-Hakim, the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of his advice to his son, Ya bunayya la tushirq billah, inna shirka la dhulmun azim, and so on. We know that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum also had great wisdom. Umar radiallahu anhu, for example, he was known for having such great wisdom and insight that Rasulullah said, if there was a prophet after me, it would have been Umar. It would have been Umar ibn Khattab. So that shows you, just like there's wisdom to be found from the examples in the Quran, there's wisdom from the examples in the Sunnah and the people in the Sunnah, and those are the Sahaba, radiallahu alayhim ajma'in. So also, Talut radiallahu anhu, rahimahullah, He's mentioned as one of the great generals in Bani Israel. He's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. He led an army and he led Dawood against Jalut, David and Goliath, the famous story. So he led Dawood in this story which included many tests. They went to a river, a giant army starving and thirsty. They went to a river to quench their thirst. And Talut said, anybody who drinks it is not from among my party. He's not from among me. So then most of them drank from it except a very small portion. So that was a fitna right there. 
So although he was a great general and he led the people of Bani Israel, he led them to victory in Bayt al-Maqdis, may Allah return it to the Muslims. Likewise, Khalid ibn Walid is a sword from among the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if he is not one of the greatest generals to ever walk this earth, then there's no such thing as being a great general. Because Khalid ibn Walid was the unsheathed sword of Allah azza wa jal. Similarly, no doubt that Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, was very wealthy, but she preferred the life of the hereafter over the riches that Fir'aun gave her in this dunya. So she said, رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ In Surah Al-Tahreem, she says, O oh Allah, build for me a house in Jannah and save me from the evil of Fir'aun and his actions and from the oppressive people. And of course, inshallah, we expect that Allah gave her more than what she could ever imagine. But similarly, Khadija radiallahu anha, she also had great attributes in the sense that she was a great businesswoman and she had much wealth. But she preferred to live with Rasulullah even through hardships and even through the starving boycott that was issued upon Banu Hashim. When the Quraysh boycotted them because they supported Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa However, she went through that until her death. She died in that state because she preferred the akhirah to this dunya. So there's great, great examples in the sunnah and in the sahaba that we can all learn from and that we should learn from in order to benefit optimally in our iman bi So now we know that studying Islamic history has great benefits from the individuals that we study. However, Studying Islamic history also has many other benefits, one of the greatest of which is that it connects us with our identities as Muslims and with our roots as an ummah. We say we're Muslim, we love to be Muslim, alhamdulillah for Islam, but we don't really know what this ummah really was built upon. We don't know the historic tests that Allah put upon this ummah and how we made it through it by the permission and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then by the great great strives of the icons and the legends and the revivers of Islam, the first and foremost of which were the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then the Sahaba. So if we don't know where we're coming from, then how can we know where we're going? If we don't know what this Ummah was built upon, how do we know what we should even strive to do with it? It makes no sense. It really doesn't. So therefore, we have a responsibility upon our own individual identities to say, I'm a Muslim, you need to know what that means. What did the early Muslims interpret that meaning to be? And we need to go and implement that by doing the best we can to achieve the same goals that they wanted to achieve and that they did achieve by the permission and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we learn how events unfolded in the past, we also learn how to deal with them in the present. And whoever said that history repeats itself, certainly, certainly he told no lie. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed this statement in the Quran. He says, Sunnat Allah, Sunnat Allah allati qad khalat min qabl, walan tajida li sunnat Allahi tabdila. This is the sunnah of Allah, meaning the way that events unfold in history, natural laws. These are all, in Islamic, they call it natural laws in English, in a secular perspective. But in Islam, we call it sunnah Allah. Gravity, that is a sunnah of Allah. If you throw something in the air, unless Allah wants a miracle to take place, it's going to come back down. Or unless if you're in outer space or something. But generally, the rule is, you throw something up, it's going to come back down. That's a, a law of gravity. But at the same time, it's a law of Allah. It is the sunnah of Allah. Similarly, it can be applied to history as well. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. The full context is, وَلَوْ قَاتَلَكُمُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوَلَّوُ الْأَدْبَارِ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُونَ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا If those who disbelieve fight you, they would certainly turn their backs. And then they would not find anyone to protect them or to give them help. And then Allah says, سُنَّةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا This is the sunnah of Allah. Or in another, if you want to interpret it differently, it's the same meaning. You, you can say this is a natural law that has passed from before and you will never see a change in the natural laws. This is a sunnah of Allah. The way Allah desires events to unfold. The pattern of events that always go the same way. And you will never see a change in this pattern. So if we see what happened in the past and the consequences of that, 
then certainly we can see how best to adapt to our conditions and to achieve great successes in the present. So now alhamdulillah, without any doubt whatsoever, we know that fitan are to be expected. We know that tests and tribulations from Allah Azza wa Jal are to be expected on an individual level, on a social level, on a spiritual level, on a mental, physical, every type of test, Allah will give it to us. However, how do we actually go about succeeding in these tests? How do, the, how do we actually, quote unquote, study for these exams? To know that we will be rightly guided, inshallah, by the permission of Allah. How do we know the best way of going about dealing with these tests? And the answer, walillahi alhamd, has been given to us, just like the answer to everything else, has been given to us in the Quran and the Sunnah. And we look to the hadith narrated by Al-Arbad ibn Sariya, رضي الله عنه وعظنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم موعظة وجلت منها القلوب وذرفت منها العيون رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم advised us with such great advising and such a powerful speech and message that the hearts were shaking and melting and the eyes were shedding tears فقلنا يا رسول الله كأنها موعظة مودع فأوصنا يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم It's as if this is a farewell sermon, a farewell advice. So give us, recommend us something to do. Tell us what we should do يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أوصيكم بتقوى الله عز وجل والسمع والطاعة He says, I encourage you and I recommend to you and I hold you responsible to have taqwa of Allah, to fear Allah in a way that keeps you obedient to Him and keeps you away from doing what He prevented you from doing. وَالسَّمْعِ وَالطَّعَ And obeying the leader of the Muslims. Although this has implications, including if the leader tells you to do something haram, then you don't do it. But generally, you stick to the jama'ah of the Muslims. You obey the leader to keep the ummah united. وَإِن تَأَمَّرْ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدِ even if a slave is appointed as your ruler. This means that no matter what, stick to the jama'ah of the Muslims and don't cause fitna by dividing and having separate rulers. So always abide by the ruler unless he is telling you to disobey Allah. And in that case, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to a creation in the disobedience of the creator. Then he says, فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا For verily those who live long enough from among you will see great division and disunity. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ So upon you is the responsibility to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided successors. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Al-Hasan. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدَعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And beware of the dangerous newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter, every innovation, every bid'ah is a misguidance. Even if you think it's good. You think you're doing something, you're introducing something new to Islam, you're following Islam in a way that is not in accordance with the sunnah because you see that there's more benefit in it, then verily, even if you don't understand, this is an evil and it will be a misguidance. It will throw you off the straight path, which you ask Allah to give you 17 times a day. When you say, sirat al mustaqim, you're saying, oh Allah guide us the straight path. Meanwhile, you go and you create a bid'ah and it throws you off the path. It's a contradiction. So stick to the sunnah because it's the best of ways. So he commanded us to obey Allah and to obey the rulers. And then he prophesied that the ummah would divide. And in another hadith, he tells us that the ummah will divide into 73 sects, 72 of which are in the fire, and one will be on the straight path. So they asked, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the straight path, which one will be prevented from the fire? He says, the one that is on my sunnah and the sunnah of my companions. Here again, he says, I encourage you and I command you to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa. So don't stray, don't deviate from the golden path of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
He stressed it so much that he even told us to grab onto it with our molar teeth. That's like saying in English, grab onto it hand and nail. As hard as you possibly can. It's not like, alright, it's getting tough right now. Alhamdulillah, generally speaking, I stick to the sunnah. But in this particular instance, I'm just gonna, you know, Allah's forgiving mercy. No, hand and no, don't let go no matter what happens. He didn't say grab onto it as hard as you can. He said, even with your teeth, hold on to the sunnah. And it shows you how much we cannot underrate the sunnah. And of course, the opposite of the sunnah. The opposite of the way of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the bid'ah. The opposite of sunnah in this context is bid'ah. And to go against the traditional way is to newly invent a way. And that of course is a bid'ah. So what did the Sahaba say about bid'ah? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, first of all, actions are what justify words. So if you have words, they can, they're nothing. Words by themselves are nothing. Anybody can talk. But you have to have actions to support those words. And actions and words together, they are nothing. Unless you have an intention, which is justified. And in actions and words and intentions, all of that is nothing. Unless it's in accordance with the sunnah. Powerful words. So even if you mean good, you intend to do something good, you're not trying to disobey Allah. But you don't do it according to the sunnah. It's, this is a bid'ah. This is evil and it is sinful. So if you say, I'm going to make dua after every single salah, in jama'ah, Allahumma did That's a bid'ah. It's a bid'ah. It's not permissible in Islam. Even if you intend good. Oh ya akhi, how is it's just doing dua? How is dua bad? Dua is great. But doing it like that, after this specific, in a specific time, in a specific location, in a specific way, that's not in accordance with the sunnah, Dua is good, but that's bad. That's bad. Because if you're, you're saying that Rasulullah he didn't know about this. He didn't know that there's benefit in this, but Alhamdulillah, I know that there's benefit, so I'm going to do it. Ya akhi, stick to the sunnah. If Rasulullah did it a certain way, do it the same way. If he didn't do it, then don't do it. And we're talking about specifically worship. We're not talking about worldly matters and technology and so on and so forth. We're specifically talking about matters of ibadah, worship. When Rasulullah told us to worship a certain way, but we do it and we leave it at that. We don't add or decrease. Okay? Rasulullah said, تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى مَحَجَّةٍ بَيْضَاءٍ لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكَ I have left you on a white plain. Its night is as its day. لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكَ Nobody strays from this straight path except that he is destroyed. Nobody strays from it, except that he is destroyed. How much tolerance does Islam have for bid'ah? Zero is an understatement. Don't innovate in the religion of Allah, because if you do, you are destroying yourself, first and foremost, and you are helping to try to destroy the religion, even if that's not your intention. And there's not a single bid'ah that's introduced, except that a sunnah is withdrawn. So we seek refuge with Allah from that. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar, he even said, every single bid'ah is misguidance, even if the people think it's good. And I think we've covered that enough. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, I will not leave anything Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did, except that I will also do it. For I fear that if I were to leave any of his commands and ways, that I would deviate. It's Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr, you think Abu Bakr is going to be a muqtada? He's going to deviate? He's going to be one of the people of desires and bid'ah? No. But it shows you that if he needed to stick to the sunnah so much, then we need to do it just as much. Because if he feared that he would deviate, and he, he was the closest one to Rasulullah who are we? Who are we? You think he's going to get it wrong and we're going to get it right? No. That means if he was so stern and the Sahab were so stern in fulfilling the Sunnah, we have to be just as stern. No tolerance for any type of innovation in Islam. Zero. A zero. This has to be your personality. This has to be who you are. When you see bid'ah, you should hate it. You shouldn't say, Alhamdulillah, he's Muslim and he has his ways and I have my ways. And it's great at the end of the day because there's so much difference in culture and tolerance. No, man. This is not the way of the Sunnah. This is not the way that Sahaba understood Islam. They understood it correctly. If you understand it differently, you're wrong. Straight up. Straight up. And I think we've covered that enough for now, inshallah. 
So as long as we stay sincere to Allah, we remain sincere and we follow the guidance of the Qur'an and the Sunnah in the way that the Sahaba and the rightly guided Muslims understood it, inshallah we're going to be in good hands. And we will be safe from the fitan, from the fitan and the tribulations that Allah will test us with. And if we stray from that path, then we can expect the greatest of fitan and tribulations. So, the types of fitan to be covered inshallah, number one, is small-scale rebellion against the Khilafah. And this includes the apostate wars, which was the, most, the former Muslims who accepted Islam and then they rebelled against the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh. Another will be the Khawarij and how they rebelled against Ali ibn Abi Talib. And another example from among the many, inshallah, will be the Abadila and other Sahaba who rebelled and they did not accept the Khilafah of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, especially Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu Another type of fitan to be covered will be the full-blown civil war type, including the fitan between Ali and Muawiyah. And this is when there were two khulafa at the same time. Another example of that would be uh, Marwan ibn al-Hakam and Abdullah ibn Zubair. Two different people claiming to be khulafa at the same time. Another will be Yazid ibn Muawiyah and Abdullah ibn Zubair. And during this time, many of the scholars will say that actually Yazid was more justified in his Khilafah than Abdullah ibn Zubair. Uh, after Yazid died, Abdullah ibn Zubair was the unanimously elected Khalifa. And that's inshallah, we'll cover that in great detail later on. A third one is when there was three Khilafa at the same time. Yeah, three Khalifas. And this was Abdullah ibn Zubair versus Marwan ibn al-Hakam and Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, uh, both of those being from Bani Umayyah. And the third Khalifa at the same time was Al-Mukhtar ibn Abi Ubaid in Iraq. So Abdullah ibn Zubair actually appointed somebody to be, the, uh, to be his governor in Iraq. Then he goes and rebels against Abdullah ibn Zubair and he becomes his own Khalifa. So we will cover these very interesting times in great detail, bi'ithnillah. And the third type of fitan that we will cover inshallah is subdivided into two types. This whole category is based on aqidah, divisions amongst the Muslims in aqidah on a political level. So the first subgroup is, the deviant group is the rebellious group. So they're not mainstream, they're rebelling against the mainstream Muslims. And such as the Khawarij, the Jahmiyyah, and the early Shia, when they rebelled against the Khilafah. And the other category is, the deviant group is government sponsored. And that will be mostly spoken of inshallah when we talk about the Mu'tazila during the Abbasi Khilafah. When the Khilafah itself sponsored the Mu'tazila sect before it went out of fashion. So for three consecutive Khulafa were Mu'tazili in their Aqidah. So they followed a deviant sect, one of the most deviant in Islamic history. So those are the main types of fitan that we will cover bi'ithnillah. And specific events inshallah to look forward to in this series will be number one, the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the appointment of the first Khalifa. Number two, Usama's army. Number three, the wars of apostasy and false prophets. Number four, the murder of Umar ibn al-Khattab. Number five, lies against Uthman and his murder. Number six, Ali versus Aisha, Talha and Zubair and the battle of the camel. Number seven, origins of the conflict between Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number eight, the battle of Siffin and the arbitration. Number 9, origins of the Khawarij sect and Shia sect. Number 10, assassination of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number 11, the short Khilafah of Al-Hassan ibn Ali and his assassination. Number 12, passing of the Khilafah from Muawiyah to Yazid. Number 13, the battle of Al-Harra. Number 14, the assassination of al Hussein ibn Ali and the tragedy of Al-Karbala. Number 15, Abdullah ibn Zubair takes bay'ah for Khilafah in Mecca. Number 16, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad pushes Marwan ibn al-Hakam to call for the Khilafah for himself. Number 17, the first siege of Mecca and the destruction of the Kaaba. Number 18, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan sends al-Hajjaj for the second siege of Mecca and the second destruction 
of the Kaaba as well as the martyrdom of Abdullah ibn Zubair. Number 19, the oppression of Bani Umayyah and the death of Al Hajjaj. Number 20, the assassination of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Rahimahullah. Number 21, the fall of the Umayyad Khilafa or the Umawi Khilafa and the rise of the Abbasi Khilafa. Number 22, the influx of foreign philosophical ideas into the Islamic Aqeedah, including and leading to the Mu'tazili sect of Islam. Number 23, the great fitna of the so-called creation of the Quran as well as the historical stance of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal against the Khilafa and three consecutive Khulafa. Insha'Allah, this is the outline for the series that we will insha'Allah engage in. And we ask Allah to bless this series with great morals and lessons that we can learn and apply to ourselves and to those around us and to teach to others in order to make our lives and communities and the Ummah as a whole more successful according to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, walhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.